mind explaining yourself, rookie. Abetting a felon is not just a fail offense. It's a crime. I already picked up the fail when I lost my primary weapon. I'm not going to be a judge, and I don't need to be a mind reader to know it. He's a victim, not a perp, and until my assessment is formally over, I'm still entitled to dispense justice. And that's what I just did by letting him go. Maybe that will be the one difference I do make. You ready? Yeah. You look ready. Makes the brain feel as if time is passing at 1% its normal speed. If we play this right, we could take the whole city. Peachtree's is the manufacturing base for all the slow mo in Mega City One. You know how often we get a judge up in Peachtree's? Well, you got one now. She has control of everything. Levels one to 200. This is Mama. Somewhere in this block are two judges. That's not good. I want him dead. We're gonna have to go through him. Rookie, you ready? Yeah. You look ready. Fire! Judgment time. Let's finish this. Mama is not the law. I'm the law. Welcome to Couch Potato Theater here on the Fandom Podcast Network on Couch Potato Theater. We celebrate our favorite movies. You may own your favorite movies digitally or on physical media. However, when they air on your cable TV, you love what you're watching so much you don't get off that couch. And that's the definition of what this show is all about. I'm Kevin, your host for this special Couch Potato Theater. We're proud to celebrate Dread from 2012. But I'd like to introduce my host. They're going to help me on with this dreadness here. First of all, my fellow co-founder of the Fandom Podcast Network, Kyle Wagner. How are you? I am the law. Oh, wait. Is this the right dread for that? I, I'm confused now. Um, Christy scared me at the beginning of the show. She's, <laughs> she's, she's so much more intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kevin, well, but it's true. She, she has, no, it's she, true. It's, she, it's true. She'll mess you up, man. And speaking of our special guest uh, host here, Christy Morris, how are you? Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it's a tough act to follow, following Dred's footsteps, but Anderson is here to do it. It's true. This is very, very true. Okay, so before we go any further, I got to ask you something, Christy. Yeah. We, we've been wanting to have you on the Fandom Podcast Network for a while, and we figured we got to do a couch potato theater. And uh, you sent me a list of films, and you included Dredd. I'm going to be completely honest with you. This was one of the last movies that I thought that you might 
suggest. I'm not making any judgments here, but I've seen you talk about other films and other interest and stuff. And I'm like, you mean the one from 2012, the extremely violent one with Carl, Ur <laughs> Carl Urban. And so why dread 2012? Because that is actually the first dread I ever saw. And uh, I love Carl Urban. And it, it's funny because, you know, you, when you look at me and you, like you said, see the other things that I usually say are my favorites. You wouldn't think this at all, but there is that side of me that's like, likes 300, likes Dread, loves Predator, but you already talked about that, so. We got to dive into that deep side of Christy sometime soon, Kyle. I mean, we're just <laughs> well, tipping well, the iceberg now, here, but. <laughs> Kevin, you should have known all along that that dark side existed because we've seen her Jessica Jones cosplay. This is very true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Now, yeah, she nailed that. That was good, Christy. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, Christy, thank you for joining us here. But before we move on, we'll let the listeners know and how they can reach us and the Fandom Podcast Network and Couch Potato Theater. First and foremost, Fandom Podcast Network is now on YouTube. Please head over to YouTube, search Fandom Podcast Network, and please give us a subscribe. Uh, we're trying to get more subscribers and all of the content even all the audio podcasts you can watch on YouTube. And we're going to, of course, also have exclusive live events on YouTube, even some Couch Potato Theaters live. Kyle? I just wanted to interject with that as we're recording this particular podcast. Our newest YouTube show just went live, The Fandom Show, where we're going to be have a roundtable discussion once a month discussing all things fandom with all everybody involved at the Fandom Podcast Network rotating in and out, plus our good friends, like maybe Christy Morris at some point. Yeah, I'm just going to put you on the spot there, Chris. We might draft you for one of those okay. shows. You sound like you're in? Oh, of course. Anytime. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. Cool. I'm excited. Uh, all of our master feed for all, all of our audio podcasts, of course, can be found on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. And the Fandom Podcast Network uh, podcaster, uh, we're all on all major podcast platforms. So make sure you check that out. And uh, also, you can find us on Facebook, uh, Fandom Podcast Network. Give us a like over there. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. We are also on Instagram and Twitter, Fandom Podcast Network. My name is Kevin. I am on Twitter and Instagram at Spartan underscore Phoenix. Kyle, where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter at AKyleW or on Instagram at AKyleFandom. And Christy, where can we, uh, where can the fans find the dark side of Christy? <laughs> Maybe I should rename my handle uh, <laughs> on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Bespin Bell because Star Wars. Uh, awesome. I I'm just thinking it for for a while it should be go to Dread Bell. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> Uh, there's a, uh, there, obviously there's another way you can support us here. And we've mentioned, of course, uh, um, over on, uh, YouTube, please subscribe to us on YouTube. We very much appreciate it. But the other way you can support us is, of course, giving us a rated review. Uh, specifically, uh, if you can, if you're on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, we would love a rated review. We love five star reviews, of course, but we love feedback in general. Uh, if you can leave reviews at any other your podcast uh, catchers, please do so. Much appreciated. So here we are. We are talking Dread, the 2012 film here. And let's do a little plot description here. In the vast post-apocalyptic metropolis of Mega City One on America's East Coast, the only laws provided by the judges of the Hall of Justice, cops with the power of judge, jury, and executioner, most feared among these law keepers of the ruthless and implacable Judge Dread. More and more of the inhabitants of Mega City One are addicted to a drug that alters the brain's perception of time, slow-mo. While assigned to train and evaluate cadet judge Cassandra Anderson, Dredd is called to investigate a crime into peach trees, a notorious high-rise slum tower controlled by former prostitute turned drug lord Mama and her clan. The judges capture one of the clan's senior members of Mama's locked down the tower, leaving Dredd and Anderson with a choice, escape the slum with their prisoner or climb to the top of the tower to capture Mama and her judge as well. Uh, Kyle, yes. I just want to interject something here. The fact that it's called Peach Trees, all our Dragon Con fan listeners out there, uh, it makes me wonder about the future of Dragon Con. <laughs> <laughs> right? Does this remind yes. you at all? What was that? What was that, Christy? Does this remind you of the Hilton at all? Yeah. Just, just, oh, I, this reminds me of every <laughs> like tower or 
place that you stay at Dragon Con. <laughs> oh, the Marriott Marquis. It's because it's the tallest one, the atrium. Yes. yes. Oh, totally. <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah when they definitely. close the when they close the, the doors for for the tests and everything, it gets really scary in there too. <laughs> I want to mention something about the uh Judge Dredd history, Judge Joe Dredd, that is. Judge Dredd is a fictional character whose comic strip in the British science fiction anthology 2000 AD is the magazine's longest running and have been featured there since its sec- second issue. In 1977, Dredd is a law enforcement officer in a violent North American city of the future where uniformed judges combine the power of police, judge, jury, and executioner. Judge and his fellow J- Dredd and his fellow judges are empowered to arrest, sentence, and even execute criminals on the spot. The character was created by writer John Wagner and artist Carlos Esquera. Uh, although editor Pat Mills also serves some credit for early development. Uh, Kyle, I wanted to go to you on this because I did not follow Judge in, Judge Red in the comics, but he has a very distinguished history. So I want to turn to you on this real quick. What do yeah, you know? Judge Dredd has been around for forever. I mean, 2000 AD is still running strong. Um, he's been a staple of that. Um, a lot of his exploits here in the States have actually been brought over by Dark Horse Comics, and Dark Horse even has the rights to do certain Judge Dredd comics in their own stories and they have um i know for there has been stories where they've had uh, judge dread versus predator judge dread versus aliens when dark horse had the rights to do those those characters under comics too they do those crossovers but yeah judge dread has always had a very big cult following here in the states he it never got huge but everybody knew the look of judge dread and that's the thing that's always stood out more than anything for at least the fans here in the states is that classic look of judge dread and just to rewind a little bit, when the Stallone movie came out, the one thing that drove all of the true comic fans of Dread crazy is he took off the helmet. And that's just we're going to touch on that later when, when we talk about that, because I got some things I want to say. I want to get your reactions to that. But, Christy, I want to ask you something. So you said this was your first introduction to the character Judge Dread. After you saw it, uh, did you did you uh, learn more about it or were you just kind of fine, uh, you know, enjoying this film for what it was? I was more enjoying this for what it was. I I'm aware of obviously of the Stallone version and I like Sylvester Stallone, but I get that there's those things for sure when something has been an established character in writing for so long. And then you see something that seems out of character that it would drive fans crazy. Um, right. But yeah, I haven't gone and read the comics yet though. And that's something that I do want to do. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, was the character or the look of Judge Dredd himself was something that attracted you originally to the to wanting to watch this? Yeah, it was the helmet for sure. Gotcha. Because yeah, the X took- in the middle, I was wondering if it was to protect them from getting, you know, specifically shot between the eyes or something, or if it was more of a design choice. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about the development real quick. So this is interesting because there's a lot of comparisons of this Dread film with another film called Raid Redemption. Some reviewers drew a comparison between Dread and the Raid Redemption. Another action film released a few months earlier, noting the similar elements in the setting, the story, and characters made Dread appear derivative. However, uh, Garland and Carl Urban explain that the that the timing of when the films were shot would have made plagiarism impossible. Now, for those of you that have seen the Raid Redemption, it's a very similar setting where you get cops going into this building of these drug lords and a lot of this wonderful action, both gunplay and hand-to-hand combat, take place in this building. Kyle? Uh, The reason why people get so confused about this and why why this was... When the raid came out, the raid actually came out overseas a little bit sooner than it hit in the U.S. But the raid came out about two months before Dread hit in the U.S. before Dread hit theaters because I remember going to see the raid because it had a limited release run, and I, I saw the raid in theaters. And like two months later, Dread came out, and everybody was just like, "Wait a minute!" Because the raid ended up becoming so unique and standing out so much in that concept, and everybody thought because that came first that oh yeah, and but we all kind of got lost in that and we got forgot about wait, these were probably filming about the same time. There's absolutely no way this could have happened. It's just really, truly a remarkable coincidence. And completely on opposite sides of the world as well, pretty much. Uh, But uh, Christy, have you heard about the comparison to the raid? Have you seen the raid? No, I haven't. So I was interested to hear that. 
Yeah, I'd be curious to get your opinion on that. Uh, I'm sure that's also a film that your husband Michael would like if he hasn't. But uh, it's 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 a, it's a similar presence. But if you think about it, it really isn't. I mean, kind of like Die Hard sort of capitalized on that first where you're stuck inside of a building with bad guys, you know, (laughs) you know, I mean, I'm sure it goes back even far beyond that, you know, the hidden fortress and stuff like that. Yeah. I I think the big thing was the one basic where you have the similar while dread is more sci-fi with everything dread and with the raid, it's more police action. It's the concept of being trapped in this oversized apartment built living building. And it's basically a big drug capital. And the, 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 that's where the similarities come in and just trying to survive the experience of it. And so it's, it's a very, it's a basic theme that runs through both of these movies, but it's executed in different ways. Obviously dread with a little bit more of a sci-fi factor with the raid. You've got a lot more of the martial arts and the fighting aspect of it. Right. That's true. Well, pre-production commenced on August 10th, uh, the 23rd of August 10th in Cape Town Film Studios in Cape Town, South Africa. During the 2010 San Diego Comic-Con International in July, uh, Urban confirmed that he had been offered the role of Judge Dredd, and on August 18, 2010, it was reported that Urban officially had the role. September of 2010 announced that Thurlby, who would play Dredd's tele... uh, uh, Sorry, telepathic rookie Cassandra Anderson in the same month during uh, the Toronto International Film Festival, the film uh, attracted 30 million in worldwide pre-sales to distributors and 90 percent of theatrical markets. That's really impressive there. Uh, Let's get into the theatrical posters here that uh, we always like to have fun with. Um, I posted about four in the notes. Hill. Uh, the, the probably the most famous one is Judgment is Coming, and it shows Judge Dredd on kind of like a, the corner rooftop, and it says Dredd, and the buildings behind him are on, on fire, and he's got his his weapon in his hand. There's another one that I really liked below that, where he's kind of more in shadows, uh, and you see a side profile of him, and it says Judgment is Coming, Dredd this September in 3D Real D. Then I have an international poster here, and I really like this one because it shows Dredd on a similar perch on a building uh, with one a building behind him. But then you see Anderson uh, popping off some rounds with uh, the weapon that she procured a little bit later on. That one's a cool one. And then there's another uh, international poster that shows them side by side. Uh, but then you get to see Mama um, in the in the corner, uh, looking very menacing and such. But I want to get your opinion on these posters, Christy. Uh, did you? Obviously, I'm a, I'm a. Did you see this in the theater, or did you oh, see it on video? I saw it at home. Uh, so you hadn't really seen a lot of these posters before, then, right? No. Yeah. What are your thoughts on these as you see them now? So the the initial one, Judgment is coming with just Dread himself, is the one that I'm familiar with. Right. Um, but I got to say, the Shadow one I think is my favorite because it definitely brings more of the mystery of, you know, not really being sure what he's about or if he's good or bad. Mm, Good point. I think that the last one, um, I guess is supposed to call some attention to the slow-mo aspect of it before you've even seen the movie, but it to me seems a little too silly looking. Gotcha. Gotcha. Kyle, your thoughts on the posters? Um, My favorite is, and always has been the side shadow shot. That was the first poster I saw for dread. And I was just like, I saw it and I just instantly knew they're doing dread. Right. I was instantly in, um, this and, is, a- and ex- what you mean by that is that dread's going to keep his helmet on. Is that well, not only is he going to keep, <laughs> keep his helmet on, but they're going to give dread that hard edge. You know, if, if you go back to Sylvester Stallone movie, you had Rob Schneider and that little thing, this just between Carl Urban being in it and, that seeing this shot of it, I was all in. I mean, if I could find this movie poster and frame it to hang on my wall, I, I would. I love this shot. I love the aspect of you just kind of you don't even see Carl Urban's jawline at all. You just see the the, the helmet and the, the armor and his weapon. And it just it, it, it summed up everything for me that I wanted in a Judge Dredd film. This was a poster that was like, oh, they're doing Dredd. Oh, crap. <laughs> they're doing they're doing <laughs> Dredd. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. I know fans have been wanting a, a updated version and something a little more gritty. And that's exactly what we got. And we're going to dive into that. So there's really only one tagline and it's in the poster. Judgment is coming. You know, and that's all you need when it comes to Dredd. That, that's all you need. So, yeah. Uh, but I want to I want to ask you guys when and where when you first saw this movie and the impact that it had on you. And Christy, I want to start with you. You saw it at home. 
tell us a little about about le- leading up to and your curiosity in seeing it. W- w- was it something you were planning to watch at home, or did it just come up? Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So my husband and I had just gotten married in 2012, and uh, it was one of those nights where you're just talking about movies that you love and what should we watch tonight. And he said, "Oh man, I'd love to watch Dread again." Uh, and I said, "What's Dread?" And this was after it had finally come out on DVD or Blu-ray and uh, he had bought it. And so he said, what's dread? What are you talking about? And so, you know, it's just that thing of let me teach you something in a good way. And so he put it in and I was just completely taken away. What particular was it that took you away out of curiosity? What was the one main thing that stood out for you? That it's not straightforward. When you initially hear about it, and you know, for me, having never seen it before or before that, I thought of it as, um, oh, it's just going to be like, they're the good guys. They come in and, you know, fix everything up. But it's not just that. You know, I like these characters that kind of play with that line between good and bad. And you get to see how they develop as a character through the moral decisions they make. So there's, you know, those big moments in this movie that really show you the kind of people Anderson and Dredd are, and they end up being, you know, leaning more toward the good side, but it's not all, you know, daisies and roses to get there. This is true. This is very, <laughs> this is very true. Kyle, uh, where and when did you first see this? I went and saw this opening night and um, at the time it was called the Hollywood 20 in Sarasota, Florida. I, I was already in on this. I was like, I need to go see this. Not only because I was sold on what they were doing with Dread, but obviously I was Carl Urban, and then you throw in Lita Hetty into this, and I was like, I'm in, I'm sold, you don't need anything more. And I just, I knew the minute when you get the opening scene and you got Carl Urban explaining the world and seeing how already they were portraying the world and its visuals, I'm like, they've done it right. I, I knew, especially it, the way that he delivered the lines. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was just, it just, I just knew, and then just to watch that film and absorb it and see what they did did and i to, to this day i will easily call it one of the truest comic book translations of a film a film from comic translations top 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 five easily easily as far yeah. as being completely true to the source material uh I was really excited about this. I like you, Kyle. I was in on this from the early buzz that it got. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I, okay. So since avatar 3d was becoming a thing. Okay. It almost seemed like every movie specifically, if it was like action oriented or sci-fi or fantasy, every, everyone was like, let's just let's, because it was, they could charge more for it. And so all these films were coming out in 3d and, when I was doing movie reviews and early stuff with you, Kyle, when th- and, and nowadays 3D is not be- – it's been phased out basically. Oh, yeah, very much TVs so. TVs and stuff like that uh, because it's ex- it's expensive but and people weren't – stopped going to 3D showings and a lot of people have issues with 3D showings. But I was very critical because to this date, Avatar is still the best 3D movie I have ever seen. But there's a few – I would actually go to 3D movies even though – Uh, I didn't have to. I could have gone to the 2D version because I wanted to judge the actual 3D on it. See what I did there? Mm -hmm. I Mm -hmm. judged. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I went to see this on opening night and I went to a 3D showing. And I got to tell you, this is one of the better 3D rendered films for many reasons. Kyle? You're you're right about that. One of the reasons I think, too, that it works so well is the slow-mo effect. Of course. And we're going to touch on that in a minute. But I I think that... uh, for many reasons, 3D worked really, really well. Uh, and I, you know, it's one of those things where, like, I wish I had a 3D TV with the 3D stuff and had a collect and uh, had a collection of 3D movies. But I think maybe they'll get cheaper now. <laughs> but uh, this was one of the films I really did enjoy, and I went back and saw it more than once. Definitely, um, I want to talk about favorite scenes, and then we're going to get into the slow mo effect. But I want to talk about some of your favorite scenes. And Christy, I want to start with you. Obviously, this movie uh, captured you. Did it capture you right from the get go, or did it kind of did it take a little bit for you to kind of grab onto this film? And and what scenes was it? It took a minute to get there, um, but you know, it obviously the opening is something. Being a sci-fi fan that I'm familiar with in a post-apocalyptic world, you know, 
Um, <laughs> and I love that. So I was like, okay, all right, this is a, this is cool. But uh, for me, I think the moment that it turned to make me go, oh man, I'm invested was actually when all of the shields went down around the building. Mm. Because if you th- remember back on that moment, for one, it's Mama there with her little minion that's controlling it. And you know that at any moment, because they've referenced what kind of violence she does, that she could slit his throat if he doesn't do what she wants. And those poor skateboarders were stuck outside on that little perch with their skateboarding buddies for like, what was that? Like the hundredth floor? Yeah. In the snow. (laughs) No less. Yeah. Yeah. That was the moment for me. What was uh, one of your favorite scenes in the film? Or you can add, even if you had a couple. Uh, Yeah. So the first time that they show how the slow-mo works because they don't actually explain in that moment what it is. They just show it's some guys doing drugs and you're like, well, this is weird. Why are they doing this with the, you know, filming style. But then later, once they explain it, you get it and you're like, Oh, this is a stylistic choice they've made to accentuate what slow-mo does within someone's mind. I love it. Gotcha. Yeah. So you're talking about like that first scene where he goes in that drug room and you see him taking out a bunch of the bad guys and you see the exit wounds slowly starting and happening, all that kind of stuff. That's my favorite scene. And I know it sounds really gross, but (laughs) no, because you're right. (laughs) (laughs) Kyle, Um, for first, a couple of things. If I'm those skateboarders, I'm glad I was locked outside because I wouldn't have wanted to been in that building. This is true. (laughs) I'll take my chances outside. I don't want to be inside there. Um, as far as when I, as favorite scenes, I love the opening scene when he is confronting the surviving member of these three druggies in the restaurant, because that really establishes that he is playing hardcore dread that right. he, 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 he is, they are not going to lighten this up at all or anything like that. Urban is dread. And it establishes that right out of the get go. I'm also a big fan of when he start. You see it in the movie when he starts trusting Anderson a little bit with her psychic abilities, and you and you start seeing that. And it's this. It's the scene where it's after she saves him from the the dirty judges, and then they right. go into Mama's clay, and you, and they're working together in tandem, and it's just seamless. And that, that that's great. Scene. And then one of my other favorite scenes is the Gatling gun scene where they just yeah. level. That the whole, mini guns, yeah, yeah the, the mini guns, <laughs> and dre- you just see Dredd just running and try and trying to survive, which leads into him the reveal of, hey, there's an I can get outside now thanks to this. And so I, I thought all of that was good, but there's so many great little moments too. Like there's a scene where they dive into Anderson gets them into this one woman's apartment because she read her mind and realized what she was about, and it got them to the storage elevator. And there's all these great little scenes. And I think that's what makes this movie work. It's not, you have the one big over overall thing, but there's so many little puzzle pieces as the movie is working that just build within the puzzle until it, you get that complete picture at the end of the movie and you walk out and you feel very fulfilled because of that. Oh, good points. Yeah. Uh, the scene, of course, that Christy talked about, that first kind of drug den scene was great. That kind of lets you know the stylistic choice that the movie was going in was, was great. Uh, I, the, the, the Gatling, Gatling, um, gun scene where you just see mama willing to take out anybody just to take out these judges. That was a brutal scene, but it was when you see the camera shoot up into the atrium and you see this fire going across the atrium was just, it's actually beautiful (laughs) when you look (laughs) at it. It's a strange way to call it beautiful, but stylistically it was a beautiful choice. The there's a couple of scenes with Anderson that I really, really like in this. And there's when she gets captured by the Lieutenant uh, K, uh, the African-American gentleman, and they're kind of playing the mind trick game going on and how he's kind of challenging her. You know, when you get inside my head, you're not getting out of it, all that kind of stuff. And she does that thing where like uh, she talks about how being afraid of him taking her gun and all that kind of stuff. And so the opening uh, line that you and I did, Christy, talks about how she lost her gun. But I think when you think about it, she didn't really lose her gun. She implanted the idea in Kay's head to try to take her gun and then use it on her, knowing 
that it is DNA tested and that he was going to lose his hand. And so I love the fact that I think, and I think this is something that isn't necessarily mentioned afterwards because she mentions how she lost her gun. So she takes an enemy's gun. But I think that was like a very calculating uh, strategic thing that she did. And the fact that she was willing to take whatever consequences happen after this, but she was going to finish her job. And I loved how, as you mentioned, Kyle, that led into her and Ju- Judge Dredd just getting ready to go up to Mama and, uh, and, and kick some butt. Uh, the other scene I like, too, though, is the Dirty Judges scene where you see them hunting down dread and dreads like slowly taking them out. And there's that one main guy and he gets uh, shot behind the wall and uh, <laughs> judge is like, wait. Huh. And then the guy's taunting him. He's like, I can't believe you're on the wrong side of a gun. And then he gets killed by, <laughs> by Anderson. I think that's great. Uh, I want to ask you guys about the slow-mo effect here. I, I got a couple little things here about it. It says the slow-mo sequences were designed over several years with the intention of replicating the effects of hallucinogenic drugs, combining high-speed photography and color saturation. Alex Garland questioned if the effect could make the film's violence beautiful. Garland and uh, an FX supervisor, John Thumb, began developing the slow-mo concept sequences in 2009 during the filming for Never Let Me Go. They experimented with an effect to replicate the visual effects of these drugs and see how long it could be used before it distracted the viewer from the story or the action sequence. They continued to develop and modify the effect until the end of post-production, tweaking colors, color saturation, image framing, and camera motion. Slow-mo scenes are featured a rainbow color scheme and sparkle highlights to create an unreal, otherworldly effect. And of course, we saw that with the impact of uh, with the the bullets and the and the bodies, the ripple effects on the flesh. Um, I wanted to get your guys' take on this. This is one of those things that movies kind of have a gimmick for, and sometimes these gimmicks work. Um, and Kyle and I talked about this recently after watching Tenet, where sometimes it can be overdone and it's distracting. I don't think that was the case in this, Christy. When you saw this, did, did you see anything like this before? And this is obviously something that uh, that kept you going through this film. So it's interesting you asked me that because earlier, you know, I mentioned one of the films I like is 300. And I do think that that's a, a similar thing you see in 300, but that it was a little overdone in that movie to where it's a characteristic thing. I think everyone thinks of now if someone says I like 300 or I've seen 300, they're like, oh, yeah, the, you know slow egregious violence and blood but here they really make it about thinking about the moment and not just what you're seeing i think you know especially too because i watched the featurette on how they did this and saw what you're saying kevin about the compressed air making the skin ripple uh and how they used um you know like fake blood blood bags to slow down the frames per second and see how it would splatter And they said, you know, when you look at it slowed down that much, it actually is more like a dance. It's beautiful the way that things flow like that. And even though it's kind of gross to think about what it is, (laughs) (laughs) it's a cool thing. And they don't play it out for too long. Good point. Yeah. Uh, Excellent point. Kyle, uh, what is your take on the slow-mo effect? Uh, The effect itself is beautifully well done. And I think it was also a great effect to use for this movie, especially in the 3D format, because it really, I think, in the 3D format, it kind of put you in that realm of like, okay, you're almost on it yourself. But the other thing I liked what they did with the slow-mo too was they made it scary. And this is this is why I say this. The idea of being on this thing where it makes everything feel like slow motion and then you're thrown from the top of that building, that is hor- a horrifying thought. Because you're basically watching your death in slow motion. And that's it's it's a great mind mind trick. It, it's gonna mess with your mind. As and you know, and then you add in the effect and you add in the sparkle and this of it. So it almost makes it like it's a beautiful thing. And I it's just it it's makes it wicked in in all the ways that you're like Ooh, I'm really into this idea and this concept. And it's it was great. It was not only great use of the effect, but great writing to mix in the effect into the story. That's a good point. Uh, by the way, the movie uh, Never Let Me Go that they were referring to was the one that starred Kieran Knightley, Carrie Mulligan, and Andrew Garfield. Uh, reg- 
I want to ask you guys real quick because I just rewatched it. The scene at the end where Judge uh, shoots Mama and he's challenging like the the range that that kill switch that she has on her arm mm-hmm. will be. And you see her in, you know, getting a, a, a dose of slow-mo kind of forced on her by uh, Judge Dredd. And he throws her over and you see her falling. I want to ask you guys this because you see her falling and then you see her about like a foot before the ground. And you're like, uh, like when you're watching this the first time, you go, are they going to show it? Are they going to show it? But then they went to that great shot of her face making an impact through like, uh, like if it was like underground or under like a glass partition or something. And then you just see like the blood kind of shoot out this little X formation. Christy, when you were watching that, did you, would you, were you a little like squeamish or were you like, let's see this, let's see this girl go down hard. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I was a little squeamish, honestly. Yeah. It's funny because usually I'm not with stuff like that. But yeah, it, you're wondering if they're going to show her making a brutal impact like they showed the aftermath of the original guy she threw off. Yeah. That was gross. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, once they showed her blood making an X, I went, I see what you did there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, were you a little squeamish at that? Or did oh. you, uh, I, I just, cause that's an interesting scene to watch over and over again. But it, it, you get squeamish and you, even now when I watch it, it's still a little squeamish because you have that pause that right about a foot before she hits pause. And even though you know what the shot's going to be, you're still like your mind that you have just, your mind has just enough time to go, Oh, this is going to be ugly. And yeah. you're like, yeah. You're like, uh. and again, that's just one of those things. Great directing, great cinematography to make that moment. And, and again, so many things. Okay, so Kevin, I want to rewind for just one second. You were talking about the judge scene a little earlier. Yes. One of the things that's so great about that scene is when she says how much and they say a million dollars and the one judge, I think it was Judge Lex replies. Yeah, I know who we're dealing with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, they should have they should have sent more guys. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by the way, real quick, I just want to mention a scene that I really like was that one uh, main chief, that main lieutenant. I'm forgetting his name right now for uh, Mama, the guy that didn't really look like a thug. He was kind of dressed nicely. I love the fact when Judge finally gets his hands on him and he just throws him over the ledge in front of Mama. He's like, yeah, there's one of your dudes. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> right. The director is Pete Travis. Uh, he directed the 2008 film Vantage Point, uh, the Sean Penn 2015 film The Gunman. Uh, he's also done a lot of episodic television, been busy. But let's talk about the cast, guys. This this is where uh, things get really cool and interesting here. Um, I got to look at – the. Uh, there's a lot of these people that I did not know. But then there's some names that pop out, uh, a young Domhnall Gleeson, of course, no, you know, uh, from the, uh, the, the Star Wars uh, – Sequel trilogy. I had never heard of Olivia Thurby before. We all know who Lena uh, Hetty is, of course, from uh, Cersei from Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. And we obviously, of course, knew who Carl Urban was. But I want to get your guys' take on the cast. Christy, I want to start with you. When you were going into this film, obviously you mentioned you liked Carl. uh, But tell me about your reactions to Carl and the rest of the cast. Well, I think for sure that seeing Lena Hetty playing the villain again was perfect. I already loved her, you know, like we were talking about, like Game of Thrones really put her on the map for me, especially, but she is so good at being evil. I mean, like an Anthony Hopkins level evil. And uh, so I I loved that and the scar on her face. Um, And I think that she shows that ruthlessness, like you're saying, like with the Gatling gun, you know, she does not care. She's like, get out of my way or die too. Um, And I did want to say, I I realized... uh, Olivia Thirlby looked familiar to me in the posters and then seeing the movie, but I couldn't figure out where. And so I I looked her up on IMDb and I went, Oh my God, I know her from Juno. She was the weird girl that had a crush on the teacher. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) How did she get this job? (laughs) Um, Yeah. I think that the, the cast in particular, the main few you follow throughout the movie had to be this level of, stars because otherwise it doesn't work i think that you needed somebody to especially with carl urban you're not seeing his eyes at any point in this movie if he doesn't do a good job with his voice with the cadence with the seriousness um or even with the decisions he makes then it doesn't work either especially for something as known as judge dread 
Good points. Love that. Good observations. Kyle, uh, your take on the cast. Okay. Well, first of all, let's talk about Lena Hetty here because Kevin, as much as we love her from Game of Thrones and even 300, I think we have a very soft spot for her for her portrayal of Sarah Connor from Terminator, mm, yeah. the Sarah Connor Chronicles. And so, yes, the uh, short lived two season, it was two seasons, yeah, two of Fox seasons. television of her as Sarah Connor. She was fantastic in that. Yeah, she, she, she was absolutely fantastic. And if you have not seen this show, you need to go out and watch the show. It's incredibly frustrating because it got through the Fox treatment, which we all know what that is, but right. she was phenomenal in this show. So I was excited to see her in this anyway. And she, she plays evil so well, but she just plays hard ass so well. You know, so she, she's phenomenal there with Carl Urban. It was so important that he kept the helmet on. And this is why, because Star Trek was in 2009. Most so many of the general population, especially here in the States, saw him as bones, saw him as the new McCoy. Mm-hmm. And I think they would have had a hard time, even though he's done things like Doom and a few other things. They would have had a hard time seeing him in this role if they could have seen his face. But with his face being covered like it was. You forget it's Carl Urban. And considering the time frame of this and how popular that Star Trek movie was at the time, it worked out tremendously. Now, here's the the, the funny thing is, is now you see him more as Dread because of his performance as Billy Butcher in The Boys compared to to it's like, oh, yeah, Carl Urban was Dread. Oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. (laughs) um, I want to throw out real quick to Wood Harris, who played Kay. I thought he was very good in this. Yeah, in, in that role, and I loved it when he thought he could get over on Anderson in the mind game, and then Anderson just basically messes with his head so much so that when she gets the information, and I love this little shot; it was a little nuancing. He is actually peeing himself after the experience of <laughs> yeah. getting his mind frilled by Anderson. Yeah, definitely. Um, my man crush on Carl started with uh, Lord of the Rings, Amir. I freaking loved him as Aomir in, in, in uh, that trilogy there. I te- well, technically he was in uh, uh, the last two, but, uh, and then uh, the other, obviously Star Trek, Kyle, we know, and, but there was that great short lived TV series, uh, almost human that mm-hmm. he did. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wish that show would have gotten a chance and it did not, of course. But if you think about it for a, re- for a second, Something that we've learned about watching the Mandalorian is and we were watching like the behind the scenes with the gallery and stuff, how people would like to see actors eyes to read off of them, you know, and you don't get to do this. But what Carl does in this film is he acts with his mouth and his jaw and his scowls. And if you if you look at the way he he expresses stuff, I know we probably had to look in a mirror with his hand over his eyes maybe peek a little bit and go, ah, rah, 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 you know, <laughs> if you guys could have seen the video that just happened, <laughs> <laughs> but, but Christy, I mean, it, it, seriously, when you look at him and you're not seeing his eyes, you could see his reactions through his mouth and his jaw, right? Yeah. Oh, hundred percent. I was thinking he had the, the scowl and the thoughtful, um, purse of the lips down perfectly so i think you're right i think yes. he did practice <laughs> kevin did yeah what one other thing that was the affliction in his voice he, yeah he yeah. controlled the affliction of his voice so well that he put out a lot of what his emotions were at the time as well yep definitely uh i was impressed and became a big fan of olivia thurby i i had i forgot she was in juno i it, she didn't really do anything that that was memorable until this movie and I thought she was fantastic in this uh, with her with her um, ca- mind capabilities and all that kind of stuff. And, and I like the fact that, uh, you know, she had a reason to be there, you know, the loss of her family and that she wanted to make a difference. And I like the fact that she let uh, um, the techie clan played by Domhnall Gleeson. Of course, we know him as 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 Hux, of course, in the new Star Wars films. But uh, his character in this was basically a tortured uh servant and i like the fact that she could see in his mind of him being tortured by mama and then making that decision and and i think that as time was going on uh dread was starting to respect her abilities 
and probably lucky to have her around for obvious reasons. So I, I thought she was great in this. So, um, what I loved about this film as well, short running time, only 90, 95 minutes, came out uh, September 21st, 2012. It made its Comic-Con debut first on July 11th, uh, which is very cool. It's nice that Comic-Con does this because if you're going to cater Judge Dredd, that is the perfect uh, place to do it. it. had a budget of around 30 to $45 million, uh, worldwide grossed about $41 million. It did not do well, obviously, as, as well as most people wanted, but it did do well on video. A uh, couple of uh, critiques here, uh, critical responses for Judge Dredd. Uh, Judge Dredd creator John Wagner, who had been critical of the 95 adaptation, gave a positive review of Dredd. He said, I liked the movie. It was unlike the first film. It was a true representation of Judge Dredd. Carl was a fine Dredd, and I'd be more than happy to see him in a follow-up. Olivia Thurlby excelled as Anderson. The character and storyline are pure Dredd. Uh... Dread has been recognized as a cult film since its release. Kyle, it's weird to have a cult film be like tagged a cult film right away. Usually it takes a while for this to happen or it, it debuts with no fanfare. But there's a certain feel to this, Kyle, that I can see why it did. I, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, because the character of Dread is got such a cult status on its own already. And I think it's the way, especially around this time when movies were coming out, movies were quick to be called cult films, but dread just has that feeling to dread reminds me a lot of district nine and the aspect of how it feels of how it was filmed. Not so much necessarily. It had a okay budget, but it did the most with what it had. And it has that kind of feel of like this isn't a big budget blockbuster, but this is a very well-made film. I do think that if dread comes out now, it makes buku bucks at the box office because comic book movie, we have the MCU and comic book movies right. are it. I think Dread was actually a little bit of ahead of its time. Yet another reason why it gets that cult movie status. Uh, Christy, when you were watching this for the first time and then as time went on, did you get that feeling that it was a cult instant cult favorite? I did actually um, on release as well, you know, and when I saw it for the first time, because it does exactly what you're saying, Kyle, with it feeling like it's not a huge budget, even in the set design with how they have, you know, the buildings laid out in mega city and everything. It doesn't feel like um, a Tron or something, you know, where it's got this um, bombastic nature about it. It feels like a world that's very contained and they're only giving you on a need to know basis pieces of the information and so it feels a little bit more like an almost an independent film or something to me than um you know these big budget blockbuster films just watching it and then you know so it is kind of weird to call something a cult film when usually like you're saying kevin later that develops on its own but it, it does feel like one uh another aspect of self-contained story you don't get an you don't there's not an origin there's not this oh well we could have sequels or leaving on a cliffhanger or anything it's 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 self-contained yep you don't you don't need the origin you don't you just you're pulled right into the world they give you the understanding of it and at the end of it it's like okay well we could definitely see more of this but we're not you, it's like but you don't you don't have to have more of it per se as far as oh well we know that we know the sequel's coming we wish the sequel yeah. was coming, but we just, you know, it's, we know. Yeah. Uh, and this film had received positive reviews from uh, just about everybody that seen it. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 79% uh, fresh rating fueled by bombastic violence and impressive side effects rooted in self satire and deadpan humor. Dread does a remarkable job of capturing its source materials, gritty spirit variety said uh, grim, gritty and ultra violent called Dread a badass of few words and wrote that Urban does a fine job embodying the more mythic qualities of Dread. Uh, Entertainment Weekly said um, a dark, funny, blood-soaked romp and singled out Urban for his credibly wry performance using a little more than his uh, gravelly? Gra gra gravelly? Gravelly, maybe. Word? Gravelly, okay. yes. Uh, imitation of Clint Eastwood and his chin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dread was released on DVD and Blu-ray January uh, 2013. There was a 3D versions as well. 
Uh, during its first week in UK, it was the number one selling DVD. Uh, and it's interesting here. It says by September uh, 2013, Dread was estimated to have earned approximately 10 million in home video uh, sales in North America, while in the UK it marked over 270 days on an online retailer. Amazon's top 100 selling home media by 2017, the sales figures was estimated to increase to 20 million on home video. So obviously, this this uh, uh, movie uh, hit a chord uh, on home video later on. Obviously, Christy, uh, you watch it. Out of curiosity, do you guys have a physical media copy of it? Yeah, that's how I saw it. Okay. I didn't know if you guys were digital people, so I had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I weigh in on that, Kevin? Because, you know, I'm, oh, of course. You know, I'm, I'm the digital. Apple iTunes just within the last two weeks upgraded Dread to a 4K Dolby Atmos soundtrack <laughs> and visual. And That's I got to watch. Gorgeous, I, got to, I got to watch out of my 4K TV with my Dolby Atmos system, and the sound on the Dolby Atmos is just mind blowing. <laughs> and I did want to give a, a quick shout out to you to Kyle earlier for when you said uh, the way that the um, slow mo was used to make it even more scary, and you know the death scenes. I think that you hit it the nail on the head so much. I, I couldn't hold in how excited I was because it is like it, it, you can't decide is it worse to be dying from a long fall or be dying from a long fall that you remember every second along the way. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, you just go, I'm going to enjoy it for a second or two before I'm out. I don't know. Because <laughs> when she's making that swan dive, she's putting her arms back. She's like, all right, I'm out. I'm going to enjoy this. Yeah. <laughs> Greg Luganis <laughs> all the way. <laughs> Congrats to you, uh, Dread. You got me. I'm out. Okay. Okay, so there's a couple of things that very that define Dread, Christy. Of course, his helmet. And not taking the helmet off, this was one of the big things about this film, but it's also his Lawmaster motorcycle and, of course, his Lawgiver weapon. Uh, the Lawmaster motorcycles are actual functional bikes ridden by actors and stunt performers during the filming. The original bike was customized by having a chassis extended and custom fairings added, as well as being fitted with the largest tires that would allow the motorcycle to remain operable. Uh, the weapon, the Lawgiver, was developed as a fully functional weapon based on a 9mm firing system capable of firing ammunition and being changed from automatic to semi-auto fire. Uh, Kyle, I want to ask you about this first because these are the most iconic things, especially with his, uh, you know, we got a different, more of a kind of a cartoony version uh, in the 1995 version with Stallone. They were still cool. Uh, and then we also got the weapons, but the, the weapons are kind of smart weapons, which is great about this. You can uh, mention commands and it'll shoot different uh uh, rounds of ammunition and they're coded to each uh, judge. What was your take on this dread version of these toys? They, they, they nailed it. And just be glad I don't ask for high X rounds, Kevin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, um, what was the one he said in the beginning with the perp? What was it? Hot head or yeah. what, what did he yeah, say well, where he shot the one into his mouth? Oh, and I can't, just, like, I can't start. Remember. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. But um, they, they, they nailed the, nailed it so well. And, you add into the fact that even though you don't see the, the lawmasters that much, they didn't have that cartoony look to them. And you know, the, the outfit, what was great about the outfit was in the Stallone version of dread. It, it, it did stay true to the look of it, but it just didn't feel practical. It was the typical, all the dread, the, the judge outfit that Carl urban wore was practical. It had tactical armor on it. It had reloads. It had everything, all the pieces you needed for that that and you know i think that was also too one of the frustrating things when you talk about the helmet because the helmet was spot on in the stallone dread he looks so good with the helmet on and he had he looked like dread with stallone's strong chin line and everything like that so when he pulls off the helmet it made it that much more like uh but yeah as far as the toys go and i thought the lawgiver especially in this film was done to perfection Chris, I want to ask you about these. Uh, I, I don't know if you're to me, I'm, I'm kind of a gun nut when it comes to if they're used well in films, especially if they're realistic and they show reloading, which is John Wick, which is why John Wick is so fun, because they actually count the bullets. And when he runs out, he, you know, he uses other ways to uh, get out of trouble. But what was your your perception of the weapons and the motorcycles used in this film? 
So I'll say that's kind of my thing too. I don't know if you know, like my love for Star Wars as well revolves somewhat around the we- the weapons. Like Enfys Nest uses an Electro Ripper staff. Uh, so nice. <laughs> yeah. So I was really excited to see how they would use the weapons in this movie and the Lawgiver. I love that it's got all the different functions. I think it's so cool when he gets to use. I think he said incendiary and all of the little yeah sparks. Incendiary. Yeah, multiple people. Um. You know, and then he's, you see the reflection of the flames in his helmet. Um, yeah. And you saw that shot from uh, below the atrium as well of, of all, all of them like spreading out and picking their targets. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, like you were saying earlier that it has the uh, high X function that just blew the guy's head right off. Yeah. Good Lord. <laughs> Obviously those things aren't necessarily realistic for one gun to do, but it's cool that they add the other things that make it more like a regular gun, you know, that it still fires bullets as well. That, uh, actually when she has the function of, um, Anderson has the function where it's, you know, DNA coded, I think is interesting Mm. because we've probably talked about that before with, um, safeties and, you know, the methods for present preventing regular guns from being used by the wrong person. Right. It's an interesting thought. I, I, th- I see that happening somewhere in the future. Definitely. <laughs> I want to ask you guys uh, about the music and the soundtrack. Now, if I told you guys that Justin Bieber had a hand in this, what you go, what the music by Paul Leonard Morgan wrote the film's industrial music score, and he created it to suit the film's futuristic setting. He ex- experimented with band based music, decided to sound it over pro- he decided it sounded overproduced and too safe. He turned to an electronic music and used 1980s style synthesizers and modern sound modules to create various combinations and apply distortion and other effects to result. He said he was looking to create a timeless score, which couldn't be placed in any particular era. Uh, And he references the slow-mo and the narcotic and the music that's used during that. An unofficially altered Justin Bieber song served as inspiration for the slow-mo slow mo theme. Garland said that Portishead instrumentalist Jeff Barrow sent me a link to a Justin Bieber song, slowed down 800 times, and became this stunning, trippy choral music. Morgan re- uh, cr- recreated the effect based on the modified track, which was used in the film. The film uses Bieber's music as a contemporary placeholder during editing before the score was finished. There's a few other songs in this as well. Poison Lips by Vitalik, Dubstride by Jan McCullough and Gemma Kick, Snuffbox by Matt Berry, Pontiac Moon by Robert J. Walsh, and Jubilee uh, by Bobby Womack. Uh, Christy, I wanted to ask you about uh, your thoughts on the soundtrack and the music. I think it was perfect. I think that for this kind of movie, you do need something like that that's going to be otherworldly that's going to put you in that sci-fi movie kind of feel um but also be very futuristic and i think it stands out too when there isn't as much music um you know just like talking about the helmet where you know dread always wears his helmet and anderson never wears hers um i think that having moments where there the music not being there can be just as effective a good points kyle what was your thought on the uh, soundtrack uh, I think Christy really nailed it. Uh, th- this is one of those movies where the soundtrack doesn't really stand out, but it, it complements and it works. They, I think they, I think they definitely made the right decision by changing up the music like they did from what they originally had. I think if it would have been too poppy or too high energy, it would have really detected, taken away from this. The piece, everything in here with the music is very underscored. And I, I think that works for Dread because I don't, you don't want Dread to be bombastic. You don't want Dread to have even in the closing credits, you don't have like a pop song or anything like that. You don't want any of that with Dread. And it, the music in this almost feels dirty in an aspect. And I, it just, it, that's what makes it work with this film. Right. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I, I, I think that uh, when the music comes on, it really is, it's kind of a secondary character that's supporting. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't overtake anything, but it enhances every scene that you're watching and stuff. So, and I think that the times where there isn't music is great too, uh, because then it, it brings your senses to what's in front of you and around you in, in, in different ways. 
Uh, before we head to uh, our break here and talk some trivia, I did want to mention the filming locations again. Uh, this was filmed in Cape Town, South Africa. And I'm beginning, I'm, I'm becoming a big fan of productions that are being filmed in South Africa because it, it has a certain look in certain parts of the cities. Of course, District 9 is definitely one of those as well. Uh, one of my favorite TV shows, a great action TV series called Strike Back. Uh, the first season or two was filmed in South Africa. And there's a lot of great locations around South Africa that can, uh, you know, stand in for many different settings. But this was important for the setting to give you Mega City 1 in between the gigantic buildings where a lot of stuff was digitized and put in there. But uh, like that that first uh, motorcycle chase scene, that was done in the streets of South Africa. What was your thoughts on the filming locations, Christy? And, and uh, was this a secondary character as well for you? You know, it's interesting because of the amount of things that were um, digitized. Originally, it wasn't something I thought about as much, but it's a great combination of the two because, you know, when you look at the featurettes as well, it's like they really couldn't have done as good of a job in the, the um, digitizing part if they hadn't had good filming locations or set design to start with and then add to. So, yeah, I, I think that it looks really cool. And I think especially when they add all of the additional stuff with CG, that it makes it even more um, work for this kind of look. That's a good point. What about you, Kyle? What would you say on the uh, filming locations? I, I'm with you as far as the South Africa filming location. We've seen this now in South Africa because of this, its look and of its look and in a way it's unfortunate. Works so well for these post-apocalyptic type settings, and it great. It gave this movie a great base to add the digital in because then it doesn't feel the digital doesn't feel like it's forced in. And that's your point. That's that's yeah. to me was one of the keys was, yes, you have these mega complexes, but you, because you have that real base there, it works. And instead of making the entire city digital and everything like that, y you have that feeling of a dirty city. And because it's actually a dirty city, it's it's, you know, and to just build upon that. And I think that's something that's kind of lost with a lot of filmmakers. Everything's the rush to do everything digitally now. And I think you lose a little bit of that realism, especially with action films like this. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, we're going to take a short break here, uh, but uh, up we got trivia and more, of course, uh, dread couch potato theater discussion. I'm going to let you guys know what other great podcasts are here on the Fandom Podcast Network. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. We like to continue to feed your ears by inviting you to listen to the Fandom Podcast Network and all of the other awesome shows we have to offer. It starts with our flagship show, Culture Clash, our weekly pop culture news podcast. Blood Kings, our Highlander podcast. Couch Potato Theater, our podcast celebrating our favorite movies. Time Warp, the fandom flashback podcast discussing a year in movies and our favorite pop culture topics. Enzo, the NFL podcast. Good Evening, an Alfred Hitchcock podcast. Union Federation, our Star Trek and Orville podcast. Hair Metal, the 80s and early 90s rock metal podcast. Type 40, our Doctor Who podcast. Lethal Mullet, a 1980s and 90s action film podcast. What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast. And our newest show, Making Treks, a new Star Trek podcast with a deep dive into the final frontier with host Mark Newbold and Adam P. O'Brien. You can enjoy all of these great Fandom Podcast Network shows on our master feed at fpnet.podbean.com. Fandom Podcast Network is also on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can also find us on Facebook under Fandom Podcast Network. You can also email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter under Fandom Podcast Network. Thank you for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. All right, welcome back to Couch Potato Theater. We are talking 2012 Dread. Christie's Choice, Christie's Choice. Kyle, I think I like Christie better than Michael. I'm just going to go ahead and say that right now. Well, of course, it's Jessica Jones. There's just no way you she, she she pulls off a great Carol Danvers too. I'm just you know. <laughs> or Daenerys Targaryen. I'm just gonna throw that out there.
Yeah. Our, our Not only there. that, but she has been picked up by Mr. Jason Momoa, if I remember correctly. Uh, yes. <laughs> Can you just tell us about that real quick, please? <laughs> sure. So we were at Dragon Con, and uh, he actually happened to be coming by last minute to do uh, maybe two panels and do a photo op. And I was cosplaying as Daenerys in her um, like burlap sack look <laughs> from early in the show, um, and didn't know that he was going to be coming before I started making that. And so it just kind of was happenstance that he was doing this and I was dressed as his wife on the show. And so I paid for the photo op and he thought that I did such a good job that before I even got to say, Hey, I'm Christy. He said, you're awesome. I'm picking you up. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And she's never jealous. been this. She's never been the same since. No, oh, that's a great picture. I love that picture. <laughs> that is so cool. And now anytime anyone, my, my female friends say that they like him, I'm like, well, he did hold me in his arms once. There you go. <laughs> All right. We're going to have a little fun with some trivia here, as we always like to do. And then we'll continue the rest of our discussion here. Uh, unlike the previous Judge Dredd movie, Carl Urban uh, has confirmed that the helmet will never come off and keep true to the comic book character. Kyle, I remember him talking about this before the film came out. And this was something that I think that he knew that was important to the fans. Yeah, no, it, I, that's the thing. Carl Urban gets it. Carl, he's always gotten it. He he understands it. He understands being true to the fans. And you know, when you think about it, he he's done several comic book related films or video game related films now, and he did Star Trek. And so, yeah. He, and he's always been great with the fans at conventions. He's he's always been personable. And I think that's such a key if you're going to play a role, especially like Judge Dredd, where it's a role your face is going to be covered. And that's a yeah. big thing because well, most of these actors anymore have it in their contract. They expose their face at some point that for him to co-committed like that. Um, it's, it's just outstanding. So I, I'm a, I, there's a trivia thing here. I want to mention that I th is, that is related to this. And I wanted to get your take on this, Christy in a recent interview, uh, recollecting on his movie, Carl Urban said that he refused to smile or take the helmet off at any point during the movie's filming or even between takes. He spoke with an American accent and kept a scowl the whole time and stayed serious to keep in character. At one point, a cast, a cast member made a joke causing laughter on the set. And then Carl gave him the dread stare, prompting the person to immediately apologize. Ow. <laughs> Christy, this dude is a method actor, but I think, well, I, I think when it came to this, he was so committed that he wasn't messing around. Not at all. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I think that, it, you know, it seems like that's kind of lost a lot of times where I think that, and it, and it makes sense, like actors may get into a, um, you know, a pattern of their, they report to work, they do their thing and then they go home. Whereas with him though, it feels like he's got that level of respect for the material and really wanting to feel like he is getting it right as well, that he's not going to back down and decide to, you know, get on camera, do his thing and then goof off otherwise. So I, I love that. And, and I made note that he, spoke in an American accent because he's from New Zealand and you get a little more of a, a feel of how he really talks. If you watch the boys, <laughs> I'm sure because <laughs> uh, he's, he's pretty graphic in that. Uh, he also insisted in riding the lawmaster motorcycle himself uh, in mama's penthouse. There's a, there's a judge's helmet hanging on her wall with a length of gold chain attached to it. A nod to the comic design of judge dread where the gold chain would link to the badge, to the uniform collar. Uh, regarding Mama, some of Mama's tattoos are Lena Headey's actual tattoos, most notably the flower on her upper right arm. The makeup artist took the design and expanded it to her neck and face. Christy, I want to ask you about this because then they gave her that badass scar. Mm -hmm. They gave her the bloodshot, drug-induced eyes, but they also gave her... The uh, I've been doing drugs for way too long, really bad teeth, and they made her look menacing. Yeah, they did. And, uh, you know, you can see from some of the costume stuff I've done before, I've gotten more into this special effects makeup world. Uh, I love the fact that they're able to do some of the things they do with scars, with uh, with tattoos and with her teeth. I noticed 
for sure. Because I mean, anytime she's got her mouth open, for one thing, you can see like the one gray tooth in the front. Yeah. (laughs) But like, it makes sense. You know, if she's the one that's running the operation for this drug, she's definitely doing some at some point as a perk. Oh, yeah. And I love that scene in the bathtub where you see her like splash in the water and it's like really slow and you're like, okay. Yeah. Uh, Kyle, uh, Michael B an audition for the lead role here are, our, our, uh, you know, one of our favorite actors uh, who's been missing out on a lot of great roles. Apparently we've been learning about, could you have seen him as dread? Mm, not at this point. No, I, if this were the eighties, <laughs> absolutely. At this point. No. Um, honestly, I, I can't see anybody, but Carl urban at this point in the, in the, in that role. He just, he nails it so perfectly. Yeah. Uh, my last thing I'm going to mention here is in a scene just before Judge Dredd and Anderson traveled to Peach Trees, all of the crimes in Mega City One are shown on a computer screen in the Hall of Justice. One of the first screens shows a crime being assigned to Judge Hershey. Judge Hershey is one of the main characters from Dr- Judge Dredd, the 90, 1999 or 1995 film. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into that right now, guys. I want to talk about real quickly that 1995 film. First of all, Christy, have you seen this film? No, I haven't. Uh, there's it, it's in a way it's kind of become a cult favorite because it got panned pretty quickly, Kyle, because fans were like, it is cartoony visualistic. It looks good, but Stallone took his helmet off, but I'm sorry if you're going to have a film with Stallone in it. He's a good looking guy. He's got a nice angular face. He's not going to keep, keep it on too long. Plus I think it got criticized because you had uh, Rob Schneider being very funny in it, but it's one of the things I actually really like about that film. Cause Rob Schneider steals that film. Uh, do you have any interest in seeing this film, Christy? You just kind of kind of leave it. I, th- I think I'm still going to end up watching it because I was a Stallone fan. Of course, Rocky fan. Um, I think that, you know, it, it'd be interesting to see the difference now that I started with dread and then go back to the 95 film. It's probably good. You start at the top and then you kind of judge the, the least, of all. <laughs> but Kyle, I want to, you know, we've talked about this before on other shows, but I wanted to give you a, a shot about regarding this original uh, judge dread film with Stallone. You know, what, what I think is so interesting about this, it is a great way to see the evolution of comic book film because in the 90s, they just didn't take them seriously. They were jokes. We're going to, yeah, we're going to take elements of it. Then we're just going to go do our own thing with it. And, and the only person, except for outside, even the Batman movies, when you talk about, especially the Schumacher era and stuff like that. But you you look at Dread, the 95 Dread, and I mean, that that's what was so frustrating about this film. Stallone looked the part. Stallone ha- looked the part. Everybody was excited when he was cast for this. And then you throw in the Rob Schneider comedy element. You throw in some of the funky looks that it had and some of the cartoony looks that it had in it. There's some great storylines here, but you know, the, the other issue being, especially at that time, Stallone's own ego getting in the way of the character. And I, I think that's some kind of something that happened there. When you, and then you look at 2012 Dread and you just see where it's now we fully embrace everything that the source material is and we fully embrace the character. I think, I, think, I think that's what really makes these two films kind of work off of each other is being able to have that compare and contrast. To enjoy the, the 95 Judge Dread Stallone film, you just got to kind of go into it and just expect this corniness to happen and enjoy it for what it is. That's, yeah. that's pretty much what you got to do. Uh, visually, it looked great. I thought it, it was fun. But uh, uh, back to uh, Dread real quick. Christy, if you had to take a guess on the body count of this movie, what would you guess? At how many people were killed? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to do some quick math. <laughs> let's see five ten a two uh carry the three the 20 have one whole four how many people are there? Yeah. Uh, i'm gonna say 400 uh you 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 went a little too high there it was uh, okay 100 102 but that was a good guess though there's probably a lot more they didn't show right, so no. yeah <laughs> they, well, like, she did hit the nail on the head the body count went up when they just mi- minigunned that whole floor yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of, there was a lot of deaths you didn't see, but I guess this is counting the actual on screen deaths of people falling <laughs> one way or another. Uh, before we wrap this up though, we got to talk about uh, the sequel talk on this thing. Uh, there has been sequel talk on this for quite a while. Uh, 
obviously it underperformed in the theater, but did really, really well. Gained a cult following. I think there was a petition as well. Uh, Garland said uh, that there in 2012, there's a Judge Dread television series. Kyle, we've talked about this as well, called Mega City One. I know that Carl Urban had said that he'd been wanting to do a sequel for a long, long time. And then he came across saying there probably isn't going to be one now. Uh, the, like I said, the petition happened in uh, 2013 from fans. Um, I don't know if we can blame uh, COVID on this, Kyle, but it just seems like it's been in development hell and there's just been no strong commitments on this. So here's the thing, and this is why it's so frustrating, because Carl Urban even now will jump at the chance to go back to playing Dread. He loved that he's on record. This is one of my favorite characters to ever play. I love this. I love the people who are fans of it. Um, part of the issue with Dread is the craziness of the aspect of rights issues with Dread, especially because you have the 2080, you have Dark Horse having everything that, that they have. So there's you get some rights issues there. And I think people, because the Stallone Dread movie did not do well, this Dread film did not do well, people are a little afraid to jump into it. But I think we're in a realm now where, I mean, especially with Carl Urban's relationship with Amazon now, there's you could do this movie and not you could do a series or another movie and maybe not even make Dread the focus. Maybe you go back to the Anderson character or something like that, but have Carl Urban appear in it as Dread. You know, if you do like the Mega City one or or something like that. But to leave this rich story filled world completely alone is an absolute crime right now. And and it's just, I think I agree with you. I think COVID kind of screwed some things up. I think we might have had more of an announcement at some of something if COVID hadn't have come along. Okay. Before I get your closing thoughts on this, I do want to ask you guys this. And Christy, I want to start with you. First of all, do you want to see a sequel? And second, where would you like to see the story go? I think that it doesn't require a sequel, but I would be interested in having one. Um, I think that you kind of have to have dread at least appear in it because it, you know, it started with him, but I, I think it would be cool to have an Anderson story to see, does she come back since he said she passed and still has her badge? Um, and if she does, how does she handle it? You know, is she going to be continuing to stay true to herself and wanting to make a difference or has this incident now changed her? So I, I think that would be a cool way to go with it. Kyle, uh, I'm, w- I'm with Christy on this. I want to see a development of Anderson's character like this. I don't know. It would be kind of cool to see the helmet on her, though, but I don't know if that would interfere with her abilities. But I would like to see something develop with that. But I want to see a larger threat. I, I don't want to see corrupt judges again. Uh, I, I would like to see something either from the outside or something, maybe even another larger threat threat they didn't think of. I'm not familiar with the comics, but I want you to touch on what you would like to see. And of course, the Anderson side of it. I would definitely like to see Anderson come back. And even if they made her the star of the show. But the thing with the Dredge Dread world is you could almost go like an anthology type series thing and focus on maybe like three or four different judges and then t- oh, yeah. tie, tie it together towards the end. Um, where they're maybe all working different cases that end up tying together. Um, hmm. I think I think that would that's a good way to do it. You have to have Carl Urban involved as Dread in some form or fashion, even if it's just a cameo appearance in a couple episodes, or bring him in, kind of what like Agents of Shield did in early on in its run, where it brought Samuel L. Jackson in and the, at the end of the first season, kind of tying everything in with like Winter Soldier. You could do you could do something like that, but yeah, I would love to see more of the Anderson. I'd love to see more of the world, and maybe more of the judges. I'd, I'd love to see the actual training to be a judge. I'd love to see, yeah. you know, some other some other things as far as you know. Dread has dread is kind of on another level compared to every other judge. But what is it like for a person who isn't at that dread level for for to be a judge? I would like to. I would be curious about that and what they go what they go through and what they deal with. So, like I said, there's there's so many different possibilities within this world. You could even see it from the criminal side. Have episodes from the criminal side on how they deal with that judge, the judges, or how the people see the judges. Because you're talking about people who are literally judge, jury, and executioner. So, how does the public react to that? There's like I said, there's so many different angles you could take. That's why I think something like a Netflix show or an Amazon show would be the way to go, even more so than a movie. I think Amazon, since as you mentioned yeah. that uh, you know Carl's doing so well with the boys, and I'm sure they're going to continue that series. 
Uh, so yeah, I like that idea. Um, let's get some final thoughts here. First of all, Christy, thank you so much for mentioning dread. That su- surprised me so much, but I am happily surprised. And, uh, I want to ask you, first of all, where does it sit with you now? How rewatchable is it for you? And, uh, going forward. It's something that I would always feel is rewatchable. I, I would give this movie as, you know, as a review score, I gave it a five out of five. Because, nice. I mean, it just, what is there about it that's not good? You know, I really can't find anything. And it's like you were saying, Kyle, like it's contained. It gives you just enough in this short time frame to be invested in a good story. And it doesn't give you extraneous stuff you don't need to worry about. Um, and I think that it's something, especially for sci-fi fans, like we were saying, like it being in that post-apocalyptic kind of environment is cool. Um, and that it's got that feel of um, it's just always going to be a good moral movie, which is funny to say about something that's so gritty um, and so gory. But the, the point you see at the end of it is what it teaches you about people and about how to handle situations. That's an excellent point. I'm, gl- I'm glad you mentioned that because it there's um, a moral compass that's tested in this film. I mean, mm-hmm. with Dread, you get kind of I'm not saying he's a robot. He's just so good at his job. He's seen it all before. He's seen the scum before. Uh, and it would be nice to know if if there is some type of, uh, you know, struggle that he has internally that we saw with Anderson specifically that scene. I think you referred to about the woman and he reached, and then she realizes that, that this is the, the, the now widow of the guy that I killed in the hallway, you know, that type of thing. So yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Kyle final thoughts on dread. Dread is something that I think is one what I would call one of the closest things to a perfect comic book film, as far as staying true to the source material. We're talking Dread came out in 2012, four years after Iron Man came out. So we were at a point where people were starting to take comic book movies seriously. And I do think Dread really established that, hey, you don't have to be an MCU movie to be true to true to the material, you know. And I think I think when we look back on it, I think Dread is so much more popular than what the box office said. And I think that's why we have a lot of frustrations, why we haven't got anything more with Dread. But to me, it's something I would, I'm with Christy. I would say this is a five out of five film. This is a movie I would recommend to anybody who had any kind of interest in the genre or even was just looking for a good action film. And but would you test to see how squeamish they were <laughs> first? No, you, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm throwing them in. I'm just going to say dread is hyper violent. Throw you in the deep end. Let, let, right. let them have some surprises too. Um, Give them some slow mo, and there you yeah, go. Exactly. <laughs> um, I just, you know, I, this Carl Urban's performance is perfect. Um, Lena Headey is is what she, is amazing as always. It's it's a, a beautiful world, uh, beautiful effects, beautiful costumes. Just everything about this movie is. If you want to do a comic book movie and be true to the source material, this would probably be the movie I would suggest to somebody. I mean, as great as like the MCU is and some of the DC stuff is and some of the other independent stuff being so true to the source material, this by far is I'm put this at a level as far as that aspect of it goes. And that's why it stands out so much for me. Last question before we go. Would you be tempted to try slow-mo Christy? No. Not when I saw what happened to Mama's teeth. Heck no. Exactly. <laughs> it's in Christy Tub. It's not when you're falling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Christy, thank you so much for suggesting this film. And thank you so much for coming on Couch Potato Theater. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Anytime. Awesome. Kyle, as always, brother, thank you for, uh, I guess, diving into the slow-mo effect of movies again. Yeah. I, I got to get out of here. I got to go dispense some uh, judge, jury and executioner. There yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Be afraid to see what's, what, what a, what a lawgiver in, in Christie's hand would do. Wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> uh, my, Michael with the honeydew list at the house, we get done very quickly. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, I'd like to thank Christy and of course my brother Kyle for uh, another 
great Couch Potato Theater talking Judge Dread 2012. Until next time, we will see you on the couch. Thank you and goodbye.